I, I very rarely feel like Monday blues when I started work. You mentioned earlier when people looking for a job, they're mm. thinking about pay, mm. they're thinking about maybe branding of the place, whatever. Mm. Those were not my considerations. Mm. I'm doing the things I, I want to do. Mm. I enjoy doing. I think that is very important. When it is not a job, then it's just living. Mm. It came with huge financial risk. Mm. I went from a well-paid, steady job to overnight, basically having no income. So it takes passion. It takes a lot of belief that this is really something that you want to try. Hello everyone, welcome to Ask My Leader, brought to you by Google Channel. I'm Eric, I'm thrilled to have you to join us in this journey as we deep dive into the minds of today's leader. In each episode, we will explore personal growth, effective finance management, and investment strategies that have shaped the life and career of our guests. Whether or not you are just starting out or scaling new heights in your career, I believe there's some things for you to learn. We are here to inspire you, challenge you, and even change the way you think about personal development and leadership. And hey, if you find these episodes valuable, do us a favor hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Your support help us keep bringing in amazing guests and crafting these stories to you. We also want to hear from you. So join us at community.goodwill.com. Share us your thought and feedback. All right, let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome to Ask My Leader and thank you, Xin Kui, for joining us in this episode. Thank you, Eric. Very yeah. happy to be here. Opportunity, I really like to thank uh, one of my leaders, uh, Jin Xian, for inviting me to have your book launch at uh, the book bar. So it, it's really an uh, interesting uh, I encountered back then. Actually, before book bar, I already know you. I mean, you like you wrote the book, yeah. but I didn't know I had the chance to meet the Ringo Water yourself. So this is Xin Hui, Te Xin Hui. So he has wrote a lot of books, and one of the books that he wrote is Neither Civil or Servant. All right. So this is Philip your book. Before this, I actually bought Kirk Ling Bing book, okay. which is your latest book. I found this book through some of the social media posts. I like to read biography, autobiography. I like to learn from the actual person that running the business, running the show. And then I bought the book. After I read the first few chapters, Jin Sen asked me, Hey, are you interested to go to this book launch? And then, huh, book launch? I never went to any book launch before. So I was like thinking, wow, is that an opportunity to meet the real person? So I just said, oh, yeah, I want to go. Because I already bought the book. <laughs> Why not just meet? That's the first time I meet you in yeah, person. Yeah. I always thought author who write biography should be very serious. <laughs> because you are interviewing very serious people. I didn't know you are so lively. You talk a lot about the, the funny stories that we'll be talking about later on. Before I start a brief reduction, Fashion Way wrote a, a lot of books, especially biography for Philip Yo, Kurt Ling Bing, The Fair Price book as well, The Eight Fools. You wrote a lot of books. And before that, I did some studies. You are also a journalist. That's right. There's also explained that you have run companies that mainly in writing. Yeah, so later we'll talk about uh, not draft. Before we start, would you like to uh, briefly introduce yourself? Hi, hi everyone. I'm a writer. Mm. I've written 12 books. And my latest book is like what Eric just shared, was launched about six months ago mm. in November. And it's called Strictly Business, the Quick Ming Bing story. Quick Ming Bing, if you're not familiar, is the executive chairman of um, CD Developments, one of the biggest property developers, hospitality player, in Singapore as well as in Asia Pacific. So that is my latest book. But before that, I've written plenty, including a two volume series on our Singapore former prime minister, Mr. Go Chok Tong. Mm. And of course, the first biography I wrote, which is on Mr. Philip Yeo, neither mm. civil nor servant. Prior to that, I was actually with the Straits Times. Our company is called the Nut Graph. It's a strategic content and communications agency. We focus a lot on content. Before I start, maybe I would just like to rewind back a bit of time. Sure. If you can share with us in your grown-up days or when you were kids, is there any encounters or any stories that you remember and then you still hold on to some of the, the learnings or values that you have? Oh, okay. That's a tough one. I'm, I make a living now telling stories through books mm. most of the time. And so I think that I've always been very fascinated by stories, right? If you ask me for way back childhood, I am struggling to think of any one story. Mm. But what I do remember is that my dad is a very good storyteller. Mm. So he would always tell me stories, usually about 
history about Chinese mythology also. And he will share with me a lot of contemporary history about our region, about China. And I think that the ones that I enjoy the most would be the personal history of my family, of mm. my dad, mm -hmm. of my grandfather, of my grandmother. I mean, they were generations that have been through a lot of changes, mm. a lot of difficulties. Mm. And so hardship. you get hardship mm. for sure. So you can imagine that their stories are very rich, very colorful. My grandfather came as a teenager alone from China as an orphan, make a living for himself, went through the war and everything. So it's fascinating stories. And I think that hearing all these stories growing up, you learn a lot about staying strong, that mm. this, this is what's required. We are immigrant people. You, you need to stand up, be independent, mm. be, be strong. I guess that is some takeaways that you ask me now when I think that's how I explain it. Obviously, when I was younger, you don't think so hard. You're just enjoying the stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think one of the things that you should just your, your parents, your dad, mm. like to tell a lot of stories. Yeah. I think that's a very interesting background that brought you to right now also telling stories. I think so. I think there's definitely some influence there, mm. right? When you have a parent who's passionate and mm. Emma is very passionate about telling stories, then you're driven in this direction and, and unknowingly, I, through my, my studies, I get towards humanities, I get towards the social sciences. I tend to do a little bit better in those subjects yeah. versus the science and the, the mathematics subjects. And then slowly, step by step, when I finish school, I look at it and I go, okay, I think being a journalist sounds quite fun. You know, <laughs> as well, I applied for a job. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, actually, I was just like about to ask you, how do you step into a journalist? Because for us, I just speak for myself, for, for, for myself like, yeah. when we go into a, a, a job or a career, one of the things we, we think about is the money, yeah. <laughs> money side of it, or even prospect side of it. So when you choose journalism, what attracted you? I finished school, like I said, and I, I really didn't have much of an idea of what exactly I wanted to do. Yeah. Then I always recall a classmate said, that, hey, SBH is looking for people for a journalist. And I thought, okay. I studied political science in the mm. US. Mm. Most of my classmates went into government or they became teachers. I considered both and thought that maybe they were not so suitable for me. I guess I wanted something a little bit more high energy, less, less bound. And so journalism appealed. Then when I applied to SPH, they told me that there's a vacancy in Straits Times sports. Sports, mm. covering sports. And that was fantastic news for me because I'm a big sports lover. Mm -hmm. right? I like football. I like everything. Like badminton, mm. table tennis, you name it, right? And I went for that particular role. I got employed. Mm. And I really enjoyed myself. If you really like sports, stop short of being a sportsman. Mm -hmm. And then the next best thing is to be able to attend all these sports meet as part of your work mm. without having to pay, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine that I get to watch football matches as part of my job. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Um, and, yeah. and your mom, what are you doing? I'm okay fit. <laughs> yeah, precisely. So I, I think that, and, and it was funny because when I started working as a sports reporter, then my father actually reminded me that when I was much younger, I had told him that I wanted to be a sports reporter. I, I had completely forgotten about it because I was very interested in sports. Mm. And my father was like, why are you spending so much time in sports? Well, You're not such great athlete. And then he said that I told him, okay, I'm not such a great athlete, but I can be a sports reporter. And turned out that was what your, I Your first job is your dream job. In a way. In a oh, way. Yeah. <laughs> so I really enjoyed my Like your first part of your career. Is, mm. Like, is there interesting encounter or challenging part that, that you, oh, I, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. Is there any, this kind of period? No, not really. One thing that a lot of people don't realize for sports journalism is that you're required to write very fast. Much faster than if you're covering many other, what we call beats, mm. like lifestyle mm. or, or even politics for that mm. matter, sports journalism, especially in Singapore, because a lot of our sports activities actually happen at night. Mm. And so you have to write very fast in order for it to make the newspaper the next day. Oh, it's like the midnight match, you have to write it before. Yes, it's yes. Okay. so you, you have to do it very fast. Mm. And I think that it, it is obviously very stressful, but I, I enjoy that, that rush. Mm. I enjoy the rush of having to do things very quickly today and having to follow it very fast was very really challenging. Mm. But if you like it, you don't find it stressful. If you, you can ask me to cover table tennis in the morning, do badminton in the afternoon, do football at night, it's fun. 
I enjoy it. Yeah. We talk about anything that made me go, I don't want to do this anymore. No, not really. How long have you been like working on sport journalist? I did sports for about four years. Mm. And then the good thing about working in a big newsroom like the Straits Times is that I get to try other things. Mm. So then I, I moved to do simple politics, mm. which is what I studied because mm. I studied political science. Then I did that for another four years. Then I got deployed to China, mm. which is also something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Like I said earlier, my dad would tell me a lot of history about China, mm. about folklore and mm. stuff like that. And so I enjoyed the chance to be able to go to China, to be on the ground, to report about the development of the country. Mm. When I came back, this was 10 years ago, I wrote my first book. It's called When the Party Ends. Mm. And it's really about how China was changing, how China has become a superpower and why we should all take notice of its changes. When you come to the topic of China, you like high energy, less bounded. Yeah. But my impression of China especially writing about them, there should have a lot of red tape around that restrict you in yeah, writing. Is You're right. I think that China definitely is, in a way, a fairly controlled media scene, right? Mm. And so there are restrictions, there are rules and regulations which you, as a foreigner, you have to abide by. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, China is a huge country. China has a lot of people, a lot of places, a lot of companies, mm. a lot of changes, which... If you are energetic and mm. if you're interested, you have no shock of interesting stories to tell. You just have plenty of things because there are so many things happening there. Mm. I like to tell people that if there is an earthquake in China that is roughly five on the Richter scale, it barely makes the news. Is you know because yeah. there's just so much happening mm. there. It has to hit like major, like Richter eight and above for it to become a major mm. news. When I was there, we could, there could be a small earthquake measuring five mm. in Yunnan. People in Singapore would they even have heard about it. Yeah. My point is mm. that there's just so much happening. There's just so rich in material mm. that you have no lack of adventures, no lack of things to write about. It's not what I'm thinking about because I thought you cannot write about certain president yeah. linked to certain countries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, there, there are definitely restrictions. Mm. And, but at the same time, there's still a lot of space for you mm. to maneuver, for you to explore. And I spent almost five years in China and I really enjoyed myself. Mm. I started by covering the Sichuan earthquake. That's why I talked about earthquake just now. So the Sichuan earthquake, which is the biggest earthquake, uh, uh, a huge amount of casualties. Then I covered the Beijing Olympics. I covered so many things, riots. The good news to the bad news, the tragedy to the celebrations, and I enjoyed them all. Wow, it's, I can it's, it's see how colorful is your, your life there. To me, one of my dreams was to cover the Olympics as a sports reporter. And to be able to do it at Beijing Olympics, which is widely regarded as one of the most impressive, biggest Olympics ever. That was a very good experience. Beijing Olympics, you might recall, is where mm. Michael Phelps won eight gold medals. Mm -hmm. It's also when Usain Bolt mm. ran the 100 meters and broke world record. Mm. So it was a very memorable Olympics. Yeah. And then I just recall their opening is one of the exactly. best openings. Oh, speaking of that, I, re I remember that the opening was so good that I have friends here asked me to buy a DVD of the opening ceremony for them Ooh. to bring it back here. Because, oh, so yeah. there's a DVD sold. Just of the opening ceremony. Whoa. That was when people were still watching DVDs. Huh? <laughs> it was a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what brought you back to Singapore? Is it they asked you back? Or... Uh, yeah, like I said, I spent about five years. I think mm -hmm. it was about time. And then they asked me to come back. And uh, then they wanted me to uh, hit up the local news coverage of Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I did that for two years. And then, uh, I, like I said earlier, I launched my book When the Party Ends. And then after that, I thought, okay it's time for me to try something else now. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to set up the nut growth. From your first job, everything is like very smooth. It's transition from sport journalist to China. It's everything is, there's no major challenges in your life. You no, know, I, I think that there have always been challenges. Mm. And, but I think I should say that, but they're not unpleasant. There are always challenges. When I went to China, obviously it's very challenging. I got to get used to a new space. Mm. I have to brush out my Mandarin. Right, I have to improve my command of Chinese in terms of reading and even writing. So there were a lot of challenges, mm. but they were not unpleasant. And I think a lot of it has to do with the mindset. Mm. My mindset is always the bit that it's fun, it's exciting, it's something new. And so challenging, it's difficult. It can be very trying. When I covered the Sichuan earthquake in 2008, mm. it was so difficult. 
the roads were all destroyed. Every person you talk to have lost someone. And so emotionally, you get dragged along as well. Mm. You, you, you feel the pull of it. But my point is, is not something which I look back and, wow, boy, mm. I'm glad that's over. No, I look back and go, oh my God, I enjoyed that. I, I really thrive on the challenges. Mm. But there were lots of challenges. Mm. Yeah, it's just that I think I look forward to it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the difficulty even. I enjoyed the bitterness even. And I enjoyed ultimately overcoming that. Mm. How can you always see a challenges as a fun? Oh, it's I, enjoyment. Oh, I think it's mainly because I, it's, I'm doing the things I, I want to do. Mm. I enjoy doing it. I think that is very important. Mm. Um, um, when I was in school, in the past, in secondary school, I think I was studying things which I didn't really enjoy. So mm. it's quite unpleasant. But starting from university onwards, when I started work, you mentioned earlier when people looking for a job, they're mm. thinking about pay, mm. they're thinking about maybe branding of the place, whatever. Mm. Uh, those were not my considerations. Mm -hmm. My considerations were, is this a job that I'm going to enjoy? And I have held on to that pretty much through my career. Mm. Is this something that I will enjoy doing? Mm. Of course, the money is important. Of course, the lifestyle is important. But those are secondary. The most important thing to me, is this something that I want to do? Mm. And I think that if it's something that you want to do, is then it is not going to be unpleasant. Yeah. And importantly, I would choose to do it is what I decide to do. Nobody forced me to do it. Nobody asked me to apply to SPH. Mm. I, I wasn't an SPH scholar who's bonded and hence I have no choice, but now mm. I need to serve out my bond. Mm. I wasn't anything like that. I did it on my own free will. I could leave any time, but I chose to stay. Mm. And, and I think that makes a very big difference. You, you talk about passion at the start of this podcast. I think passion is critical. Passion is basically, is this what you want to do, right? I think that's very important. Once you have that, your mindset is correct. Life can be pretty easy because it's what you like to do, uh, right? Yeah. I, I like how you see things like, especially on doing things that you love, choose things that you really love doing. And that's when all the challenges or even hard things turn easy or turn enjoyable. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that when, when, when you started by talking about this thing about when it is not a job, then it's just living. Mm. It's so true. I can so identify with that. I never, I, I very rarely feel like Monday blues. Oh, if today I can go to oh, Monday, Monday again. Yeah. You know, Something which, for example, I'm sure you can identify like in NS like, where you need to book in, then you feel like, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> book in again. And I think it's because it's compulsory, right? Mm. It's mandatory. We have to do our NS. Mm. And so you will not give it a choice, right? It's <laughs> yeah. not something that you feel very passionate about. Mm. Something that you are made to do. But when you're not made to do something, then it's enjoyable. Mm. It's not working. It's not a job. It's mm. living. It's fun. Now come to the point whereby. When you come back to Singapore, after two years, yeah. you say it's time. Is there any hint or is there any things that change that you think, oh, it's time to move on? Uh, I think that there were, to be very honest, I think there were both push and pull factors. I think that the push factors were that the, the setup in the neutral was not uh, developing the way that I would like it to. And, uh, and so I think that I would not fit in as well. To continue on the theme that we've been talking about, I don't think I'll be as happy. Mm -hmm. I think that's one. That's the push factor. I think the second part is the pull factor, which is that I was turning 40 and I told myself that actually I have always been interested in business. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a business family. My grandfather was a twin. My father took over the family business. Business runs in my family. I hear, like I said earlier, this thing about personal stories about the family business. I've always been interested in business. So I told myself, is this the chance now for me to try do a business? And I decided uh, with the support of my wife that yes, that I will take the lead. I will give it a shot. Even though I grew up in a business family, honestly had no idea how to do business. Mm, okay, honestly had no idea. But just wanted to give it a shot. Just wanted to try. In my mind, I thought, okay, if it doesn't work out after a few years, I'll find a job, right? Maybe I'll, I even considered maybe I'll come back to China and, and, and because there are lots of job opportunities there, right? Whether it's in Singapore company based there or MNC based there. 
I even thought about it. But I just wanted to try this out a little bit. Obviously, it came with huge financial risk mm. because I went from a well-paid, steady job yes. to overnight, basically having no income. So it takes passion. It takes a lot of belief that this is really something that you want to try. Mm. A, a little bit of push, but a lot of pull factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes when you're about to hit the 40 mark, you ask yourself a question, should I do something different? <coughs> yeah, yeah. To be honest, <coughs> I'm near, near there. You're near there? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 36 this year. Okay, okay, four more years. <laughs> I, I can really re relate the, the transition time whereby from a so-called income generating job <laughs> yes. to like a venture whereby I don't know, even though next day the business still exists. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. So like from like the switch yeah. from a non pay after the first month, second month, third month. Is there any point of time you say, like, why am I doing this? <laughs> why I get into this? Shouldn't yeah. I just stick to it, get a job? Do you have this kind of devil <laughs> that's come to your mind? I think that I'll be lying if I say I did not. Mm. For sure, there were doubts. For sure, there were points where, especially in the early months, where you ask yourself, did I make the right decision? I think that you talk about income, and for sure it's very important as it is to me. I always re remember, maybe by the, on the third month after I left my job, and I saw my savings have gone down, and friends asked me, so what is it like doing business? And I always say that when you have a job, when you have a steady salary, usually your income goes up. Every mm. month, if every month it comes in, mm. right? unless you happen to spend a lot of money that mm. month, right? It tends yeah. to go up. And so after a while, you take that in your savings going up, even if it's just by a little bit mm. for granted, you just mm. assume you go up. To suddenly flip it around and see it go down mm. steadily and not knowing when it's going to go up, it's very scary. It's very really <laughs> frightening. And bear in mind, I had young kids at that point mm. to take care of too. Mm. Bear in mind as well that my wife started this venture with me. Yeah. So it is not as if like she had uh, a job mm. and bringing in income. So we were really all in it together. So definitely, I think that there were doubts. But I think that, and this is where I would like to talk a little bit about neither servant nor servant, uh, Mr. Philip Yu. I think this is where the book really makes, made a big difference to my life. Because immediately after I left The Straits Times, the very first project that I did as part of Nutgrove was this book. Immediately, that was the first project that I did. And he was such an inspiration. He's such an interesting personality for me to interview, to write about, and to be inspired by that. I just feel this, okay, my service is going down, mm. but... I'm really enjoying this process. Mm. And what is the process? In the street times, in the newsroom, you do news daily. Mm. Things churn very fast. Pa, you're out there. Next. But suddenly to transition to doing a book, which is something that goes on far longer, mm. actually allowed me the time and the patience to go into a subject very deep. Mm. The way that I could not do in street times. Mm. The way I could not do in the newsroom. Now, if you go very deep into a subject, into a person and the person is actually very boring mm. or dull mm. and then obviously it gets a bit sien or so mm. right <laughs> but I was so fortunate that person turned out to be Mr. Philip Yu mm. such an interesting personality so many stories to share mm. every I think it was every two weeks I would sit down in his office to interview him and every two weeks it was just Another round of exciting stories, funny anecdotes, you know. Because this was the first major project I worked on, I think it gave me a lot of confidence that I want to continue on this uh, new venture. I want to continue on this new journey. I want to see it. Okay. Even though financially <laughs> it was a big goal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but I really can see that the, the, the passion in your eyes when you talk about although your money haven't seen the transactory, but I can see the spirit, the belief, the faith that turn turn upwards when you start on this project. Yeah. 
I, I think I thought to myself, if this is something that you enjoy doing, mm. and I hope at that point that you become a good book, mm. then this is something worthwhile. Mm. And of course, at, at that point, I had no idea. I had never written a biography before, before this. I had this is your first. first. This is my first. Okay. And here's mm. the best part. I don't even really like to read biographies that much. When I started on this project, I went to the bookshop. I went to Kinokuni here and I started going through the biographies. After maybe about a few 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I stopped myself. Mm. So I was reading the first few pages. I mm. remember one particular, I was reading the biography of Mikhail Gorbachev, the former Soviet Union leader. Mm. It was there, I read it. After about 20, 30 minutes, I put it down and I stopped. And the reason I said that, I don't want to follow their style. Mm. I want to write my way, my style, the way in which I believe biographies should be written. Mm. Okay. And also because I felt at, already at that point that Mr. Philip Neal himself is such a special character that I should not follow whatever is already mm. been done by others. I should do it my way, his way, our combined way, something that capture him perfectly, mm. right? And I was so surprised that it turned out to be such a success. This book, I've always described it as a sleeper hit. Sleeper hit. It wasn't a hit that was expected. Mm. I didn't expect it to sell so well. As you can see here on, I'm yeah. not sure whether the, yeah, it says here over 25,000 mm. copies sold, which is a lot in Singapore, <laughs> right? It's a lot for a non-fiction book in Singapore. And so it was a sleeper hit. It was a fantastic success. And it was a surprise to me mm -hmm. that this thing that I enjoy doing so much turned out to be enjoyed by so many other people. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe not just 25,000. I, not, I, not I just... think it will be more than that. Uh, yeah. I think like even libraries, I see people reading on trade. Yes. Like, at, uh, its peak, at its peak, the waiting list for this book at our libraries was one year. One year. Mm -hmm. and, okay. the, and people were still wait, willing to wait. Of course, as the writer, I say, hey, oh, buy their book, la, <laughs> hey, yeah. support the poor writer. La, you know, like, but, but no matter what, mm -hmm. I think that as an author, as a writer, mm -hmm. what you want the most is for your content to be consumed mm -hmm. and to be enjoyed. And whether people bought it, people borrowed it, I think the most important thing mm -hmm. is that they read this, they read about this fantastic man, and from there, they learn more about Singapore mm. and then learn more about their own society. I think that, that, that that's yeah. really something that I'm very proud of. And I, I think you, you nailed that. So let's say library, you borrow for three, three weeks. Okay. So there's more than 20 people in their life. <laughs> <laughs> Just to wait for this book. So I think it, it I think it's much more than 20 because the libraries have <laughs> many copies and yeah. still the waiting list was one year. Mm. So <laughs> it was amazing. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> and I am really surprised that you said this is your first biography. Yes. I really glad that you didn't continue to read others mm. because I really I really think this is a very unique biography. Thank you. I don't know how to put it, it's like a very conversa conversational yes. storytelling. Mm. Even right now there are stories that I can still remember, like mm. how how he just I think it's the, the radar system in the radar system, he yes. really like only got permission to buy two <laughs> okay. and then he bought six. Yeah. He bought four. He bought four. four. <laughs> yeah. And then one crashed, mm. one crash on the way back. Mm. Yeah. All this inside story, does he just really share with you or the yeah, human? Yeah. Absolutely. Like... I think, I think he is, uh, he's, he's very open. Mm. Uh, he's very big on sharing. And I think that was what was, for me, this so enjoyable that I was hearing all these stories and in my mind, I was thinking to myself, how can I write a book in which the reader mm. will feel like Philip is talking to them. Mm. It's very conversational. Mm. So when you say, when you yeah. use the word conversational, just now, mm. I'm very pleased because it's exactly what I hope mm. to achieve. And Mr. Yu has his own very unique way of talking. He speaks very fast. Very often he will solo some words because he speaks so fast. And I wanted to capture that. That is also why I went with the Q&A format mm. because I wanted the reader to actually get the sense of what is the conversation with Philip Yu like. It is not very straightforward. Mm. He'll jump from topic to topic. If you don't actually get that flavor, then you're not really understanding the person. Mm. And since this is a biography, you need to understand the person. You need mm. to feel like you actually know the person by the time you finish reading the book. So I thought that the Q&A format, the dialogue format, which captured our exchanges, mm. which can be silly, 
It could be funny. Mm. It could be inspiring. Mm. I think taken all together, mm. that really show you who is Philip Yu. Yeah. yeah. But, and, but amazing thing is like, in the end, you can arrange in, in a format oh, whereby yeah. that, that, it's like a very smooth oh, storytelling. To Lauren, <laughs> to, then, 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 alone. That's the, yeah, that was very true. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what, someday he talked about like uh, his day in EDB, suddenly he talked about A-Star. Yeah. Do you steer the yeah. conversation or you just let him be? Oh, so what happened was that at the very first interview, yeah. usually you let, I, 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 he was the one steering it. And, and after a while, I realized that, oh my God, it was going all over the place. He started talking about his childhood. Mm. Next thing we're hearing about current of Hey, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in America, talking about our Singapore politics or whatever. Mm. Then that's where I realized that, okay, I have to stay. So one of the most common phrases mm. during this book was me saying, Mr. Yo, can I bring you back to, because I was trying to steer it back to the topic I wanted to talk about. And Mr. Yo's response would always be, oh, go back, go back again. Ah. <laughs> but, but he was very patient with me. He was mm. always willing to, when I said that, okay, just now you talk about this, now I need to bring you back to that. Can you tell me more? Can you elaborate? Can you stand on that story? Mm. And, and he'll always oblige me. Mm. Yeah. That was nice. I, I went to the the book bar. What I learned back then is Mr. Quack is more of a more quiet person. He doesn't speak much. Yeah. So it's a contrast. Then in that situation, what do you do? Yeah. So I, I I think you hit the nail on the head. The contrast between uh Flip Yu and Quick Ming Bing is really quite sharp. Ming Bing is far more reticent personality, not very, you ask him a question, he'll yeah. answer you a question. It's not someone who would voluntarily offer a lot of information. I had to be a lot more patient. I have to probe a lot deeper. And what I did was also actually expand the interviews to other people around him, mm. speaking to his senior C-suite leaders, mm. uh, speaking to his family members, speaking to business associates, speaking even to business rivals. Business so, rivals. Yes. So for instance, I interviewed uh, the... the Is their cousins their rivals? No, <laughs> not, not at all. For example, he runs a global hotel chain. Mm. Right? I, I spoke to someone who, this, this British leader mm. who used to run Hilton, mm. right? Mm. That would be a business rival, right? I spoke to fellow property developers here. Mm. That would be a business rival. Mm. But I wanted to get different views of the man. So people who work with him, people who live with him, mm -hmm. people who work on the other side with him. I also spoke to analysts, people who offer a more neutral perspective mm -hmm. of his achievements, his setbacks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So when I met with someone like Mr. Craig Ning Bang, who is, I guess you could say, a bit quieter, mm -hmm. a little bit less comfortable talking to, to a writer, to a journalist, then I have to adopt a different approach. Like in terms of your work-wise, like speaking to all these great leaders, great people, I can really imagine it's very inspiring, very upbringing thing. But let's go back to the realistic sense. The realistic sense from a steady job to a business entrepreneurship. Yeah. <clears throat> so money will come into the picture to whether to continue to do it or to expand or to maybe slow down a bit. So along this journey, like how do you manage finances then? I think that this is where one of the advice from uh, Mr. Quick Ling Bay is something which is very useful. So you got to make sure that you don't overreach. It is always good to run a business and have ambition and have drive that you want to do something. You want to make it bigger. You mm. want to do new things. Mm. It's always good to have that in a business because otherwise, why go into business? Mm. You have to want to grow. Mm. Right, But at the same time, I think this advice for Mr. Quack is something that I hold close to my heart, that you got to make sure that you don't overreach and you don't overextend. That, and I think many of us, when we're doing business, we can get a little bit carried away. Mm. Oh, things are good. Let's borrow more. more money. Let's <laughs> borrow more from the bank because mm. the bank look at your numbers. It's good. They're more than happy to lend you money, mm. right? And when you borrow more money, let's spend more <laughs> money. Let's yeah. hire more people. Mm nicer office. There are lots of such that you can do. I'm not saying that you can, you should not do it. But what I'm saying is what he shared with me that you should do it cautiously mm. to some extent, even conservatively and make sure that whatever you want to do as part of growth will not end up killing. We've seen that so many times mm. in business that it started well, it did well, overextended, overleveraged. Mm. Next thing, the business goes belly up. 
Mm. That happens a lot. Mm. I think that is something which I have been uh, trying to make sure that I don't do. But at the same time, you don't go to the other extreme where you end up not doing anything. That you're mm. so afraid mm. that you don't dare to grow. Mm. Uh, my business, our business, the nut graph, we want to grow. We have been growing, but always at a steady pace. Mm. Yeah. Is there any incident whereby you said no to opportunities and stuff? I think that, yes, I would say that in the immediate aftermath of COVID, so mm. COVID definitely affected us as it did with a lot of SMEs. So I think that in the immediate aftermath of COVID, we could see that things were picking up, mm. but it still remains highly uncertain. Yeah. Everyone was wondering whether, was it a Delta variant or whatever? Mm. I think at that point, perhaps the company could have grown faster based on what it was, but we chose to take a little bit slower pace mm. just to make sure that the macro environment will definitely prove to be more sustainable before we extend. Mm. But generally between me and my partners, our approach has always been that we want to grow, but at a steady pace. We don't do things which are reckless. Mm. Yeah. I think that when you have a team, when you build a team, I believe that it is our responsibility to our team to ensure that they have a steady mature and sustainable workplace. It is irresponsible as business owners, as employers to hire and fire. I bring you in because it looks good. Six months later, I lose two accounts. Sorry, I let you go. That's not how we want to run our business. If we hire you, it's because we believe that we can grow together and it has to be something that we hope can last for years and years. Yeah. yeah. I think with that, it definitely will attract a lot of people to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> always looking for people. Like what talent. you said, like <clears throat> a lot of places out there, um, uh. like um, after the COVID, maybe the first to do one, mm. go to do each, yeah. they start to aggressively expanding, hire exactly. a lot of people. Yeah. That's why the last last few months or even last one year, there's a lot of firing happening. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Of, even yeah. right now, there's still a lot of people couldn't find a job. Yeah, and, I think so. I, I I just feel that. Uh, is better uh, or rather we want to be responsible employers, responsible mm. business owners. Uh, it's very easy to actually say that I want to hire tomorrow. Mm. Just go up there and hire. If your mindset is that when things go pear-shaped, I'll mm. let you go. It's very easy to do that. Mm. Right? Yeah. But it's also very irresponsible. Mm. And I don't think that's where we are and that's also not what we want. Just now when you mentioned about you learned from like, Mr. Quack yeah. about how to manage finances. Mm. And then also from Philip Yo to be ambitious. Mm. Among others, even Mr. Go Chok Tong, mm. all of them, among all the successful leaders, successful business that mm. you have encountered, what do you think is one of the traits that they have Look, that bring them to this like, very successful states? I think there are many, obviously, in order for them to be successful mm. to this extent. If you look at the three biographies I've done, mm. Mr. Philip Yo, Mr. Go Chok Tong, and Mr. Kwek Ning Bing, one, was a top civil servant, yeah. one was a top politician, a prime minister, and the other one is a top business leader. They are in three different spheres, yeah. right? For them to reach this level, they must have great, they must have many wonderful traits in order for them to reach this level. I think today, I will just talk about one, yeah. and it's creativity. Creativity? Yes, it's creativity. I think we associate creativity with maybe Writers like myself, <laughs> maybe artists, <laughs> yeah. maybe performers, yeah. maybe even today with maybe the tech world, perhaps. Mm. But actually, whatever industry you're in, creativity is critical. You need to have Philip Yu's creati creativity to see that Singapore should go into the biomedical sector mm. way before anyone has seen it. You need to have Mr. Go Chok Tong's creativity to see that we need residence committee, we need town councils, mm. we need GRCs and all these things in order to make sure that we have a political system that is more stable and sustainable. You need the creativity of someone like Craig and Ben who took over his father's mm. business, largely property and finance and said, I want to go into hospitality and I want to go into hospitality by targeting these big chains around the world. <laughs> by buying over them. Okay. So he went to acquire the Cockton chain in Europe. He went to acquire the Regal chain mm. in US. Things like that. These are all creativity. Someone must have the idea that this is what I want to do. This is a new area that I want 
to explore and conquer, right? Without that idea in the first place, nothing would have happened. Mm. Of course, having the idea is just step one. Mm. These great leaders that I've written about all have step two, step three, step four, in which they have the tenacity, they have the drive, they have the stamina, they have the hard work, they have the discipline. They have mm. all these things. That's why I say there are lots of traits. Mm. But first and foremost, they must have the creativity. Mm. They got to have the idea, right? The idea that I want to do this, right? Going back to Philip Yu, the idea that I want to have a petrochemical industry on a reclaimed island. That's a great oh, idea, yes. is it? And, but what makes him great is that not only did he have the idea, he had the ability to realize it later. So today, Jewel Island is a reality, mm. right? Many people might have the idea, but they cannot realize it. Mm. They cannot execute and implement it. So I think that first and foremost, idea, creativity. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about it, I was thinking, hmm. Uh, aren't they visionary? Like they are, they, they, they all have their vision, very yes. visionary. But when you talk about creativity, without creativity, the right. vision seems to be a bit made, right? Yeah. Without the creativity, you will not have a vision. Mm. Your vision comes about because of certain creative spark in you. Yeah. You've got to have the ideas. This is what Mr. Go talked to me a lot about. He said that in politics, you need ideas. You got to come up with fresh ideas as to how to improve the society. Start by how to improve the constituency, then how to improve this particular area, then how to improve the entire nation, right? Mm. But you got to have the idea. When he first told me, I was also like, oh, okay, I didn't think about that. But after talking to him extensively, I realized it's true that he has a lot of ideas. Obviously, not every idea can work. Mm. Some ideas would turn out to be lousy ideas. Some ideas, after implementing, you realize that this is not the right time. Mm. You talk about timing, right? Mm. It's not the right time. But then some ideas will take off. But most importantly, you got to have the ideas in the first place. Talk about growing the company. You got to have the ideas of how to grow the company. What is it that you want to do? Mm? Before we end, we touched a bit on Nutgrudge. <laughs> so you have started Nutgrudge for... Almost 10 years now. Yeah, yeah, almost 10 years. And then, so from then to now, anything changed? And what that graph means to you right now? Oh, so much has changed. When we first started, it was just me and my two partners. It was just the three of us. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have an office. Uh, we were working from home way before work from home, especially way, way before. <laughs> yeah, the pioneer. <laughs> yeah, we are the pioneers. And I think coming back to the point about being uh, cautious, when we started this business, that's how cautious we were. We didn't even want to spend money renting an office. Mm. Yeah, we wanted to just keep expenses as low as possible. And uh, so we were, we, we had that culture within the three of us from day one. But that was how we began. And then slowly, we wanted to grow. We wanted to expand. We did it steadily over the years. And as our team grew, that also allowed us to do more and more things. But first, you've got to have the ideas. Uh, <laughs> the ideas to do what you wanted to do, right? So we began to do more and more things. And so now today, we not only do books, mm. but we also do campaigns. So media campaigns, communication campaigns that we help organizations think about how they can get their messaging out there to the target audience. Mm. We did a very successful campaign two years ago on autism. Mm. So as part of our World Autism Awareness Day, the Autism Network in Singapore came to us. Uh, how can they start to change or, or improve people's impression of the people with autism on the autism spectrum. So we came out with an entire communications campaign of how they should do it through social media, through the mainstream media, through influencer, and it was a very successful campaign. So successful that we actually won an award in New York. And I think that as the company is not graph group, we can do more and more things, more and more exciting things. And so I'm still full of passion. Instead for excitement, mm. for ideas mm. as to uh, what else I want to do. We are celebrating our 10th anniversary in about eight to nine months time. Mm. And uh, we also have some ideas of as to how we want to celebrate this milestone. It's not easy yeah. you know, for SME to celebrate 10th anniversary. Mm. So we're very proud of ourselves. Mm. Um, so I think that it's been a fantastic journey. Mm. Uh, as an entrepreneur, as a young entrepreneur, someone who's new to this, and I learned a lot, see a lot, suffer mm. a bit. 
but good suffering, good lessons, and uh, a lot of white hair. <laughs> a little white hair. Wisdom. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's why I tell my wife. <laughs> Wisdom. Yeah, but highly enjoyable. And to whoever is out there thinking about taking that journey into entrepreneurship or, or trying something new, I would strongly encourage it and say that follow your passion. I really love how you portray business. It may not be easy. But how you show just like, you didn't see challenges, it's an opportunity and that as a positive way. Yeah. Which I find is really tough in this day and age whereby social media just come in telling you so many different things. <laughs> yeah, telling you go to get skill future, to get a job. Don't spend too much time on social media. But the one thing that I need to do is like, share this message through the social media. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I learned this conversation a lot. I, for the previous few sessions, I always think, how should I steer conversation or whatever? But I think this comes so naturally from you, whereby you really share a lot of your experience. Like, not just the things that you do, it's more of the message behind it. Like, always positive, always follow the passion. Because if this is the passion, it's not challenge. Uh, it's really the passion that really uh, pull you towards the 10 year mark. Which is very impressive for SME. I, I couldn't imagine any business that can run for 10 years at least SME because whenever a business starts, they will be having a lot of different so-called copycats around that will always come in to take the market share. Or it's like sure. a lot of competitors coming in yeah. because there's always young people in their 20s. So this is also the things that I, I really asking myself now because I, I just started with the team. So always there's this question coming in. For sure. I think it's, it's normal. It's just mm. definitely normal game mm. doubts. Mm. Yeah. But I think like yourself, like Philip Yon, deep to you, <laughs> I think you have also shared the, the passion to me. I'm glad to hear <laughs> yeah. I, I hope uh, yeah. everyone listening mm. or watching will find this uh, useful and insightful in whatever you're doing, whether you're in a job or whether you want to embark on a business or even uh, improve on the craft. Mm. In my case, the craft of writing. Mm. Then I think that is something that you genuinely enjoy if a passion for, and then uh, it's worth all doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've adopted this thing from the diary of CEO. So he always had a question from the previous interview okay. and brought to the next. So I have a question for you from the previous session that I have. So if you have one thing you'd like to have, one thing, uh, and you can only have this one thing for the rest of your life, what is this one thing and why? I would like when you say one thing, you, you mean like a like a power or, anything. or, or a physical object? Anything. Anything. Huh? I would like to have the power to heal. Yeah. I would like to have the power to heal both physical ailments as well as mental ailments. If I have that, then I think that would really make a very big difference. Not just to my lives, but to the lives of people around me. Because I think that is invariable for all of us to make mistakes in our lives, to make wrong decisions. But if we have the chance to heal and feel better, do better after that, and have a second bite, have a second chance, then it, it will really make for a far better place for mm. all of us. Yeah. Um, on the pool. <laughs> yeah, I, I think definitely you have the power, <laughs> not just through writing, through words, through conversation. Yeah, you have the Thank you. deep tone yeah. that's healing. All right, so that's all for this session, Ask My Leaders. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost close to one hour. <laughs> what really? We've been talking for an hour. Wow. One okay. hour. Okay. Yeah, okay. thanks for your time. Time and flies. Yeah. It's very enjoyable. Happy 10 year anniversary in advance. Thank you. So if you have a party, I would like to join. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.